the Lord and praise Him this morning. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, our children can be dismissed this morning. You may be seated today. One thing I did forget to mention in the announcements is that today at 5 o'clock, right back there on the river at the Washougal boat ramp or boat launch, there's a baptismal service. And you're invited to come to that 5 o'clock. Uh, we'll try to be down there and just be ready to go. Those of you that are being baptized, bring some dry clothing. The river is inviting, but it is cold. <laughs> so you will need to come prepared for that. So we invite you to come and participate with us in that. It is an honor for me today to have our state bishop and his wife here with us, Bishop Knoblich. And this is my boss in the church. He is over all the churches in Washington and in Alaska, and uh, he uh, is a great friend, and we've been friends a long time, went to school together some, and are going to school now together, and I'm assuming that we will be going to school the rest of our lives. Uh, in ministry, you never stop learning. You never stop growing. You never start deepening yourself. And all the young people here today, you know we're launching our school today. You know that. Yes, Amen. I want to say to you that in all that you get in our schools, let arrogance never be one of them. Let arrogance never be one of the things that you get from schooling. Regardless of what you know, regardless of how high you go, it is always Him who's working in you. Christ chose the path that He set for us to choose, and that's humility. Regardless of whatever position that you will assume in life, if you will be a pastor, a bishop, an overseer, a great teacher, whatever you assume, always remember that he was humble. And if we want to please him, we must be humble and obedient to his word and to those over us in authority. We want to be humble and obedient in that. You said, well, but let me tell you, God honors that. God honors that. It's, it's, I've proven it for 40 years in my servitude to Christ. God honors that. Humility doesn't mean you become a doormat. Anybody that knows me knows that's about me. I'm not a doormat. But I believe in being humble to Christ our Lord. And to those over me in the Lord, I submit to them. So today it is an honor for me to present our state bishop. He's going to bring the word, and then we will go into several other things of the school and all that's going to entail and all of that. But I would like, because some of you don't know who our state bishop and his wife are, so I'm going to ask Brother and Sister Kenobis that they would stand and kind of face the congregation so they can see you. I know we have a lot of new people coming, so remember, these are my boss. <laughs> and what you do may... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It won't affect me. He's a great man of God, and I just love him and appreciate him. Dear Bishop, come and share the word with us today. Amen. God bless you, sir. Now, do I need to turn this on, or am I okay? You need to turn it on. That's right. I need to turn it on. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Wow. Great, great worship today and great presence of the Lord. Do you feel him here today? Amen. He is here amongst us, isn't he? And um, I so appreciate your pastor and his wife, brother and sister Smith. Wonderful, wonderful uh, folks and friends of ours. And I know I say this every time, but it is so true. You guys are truly blessed and privileged to have this type of leadership in your church. So let's give them a cheer. Thank the Lord for Brother and Sister Smith. In fact, I'm going to say a little bit more about him later here in terms of cloning and all this. So. <laughs> all right. I know Sister Sue gave some announcements. And it, um, if uh, you've never had a chance to go to men's retreat, guys, coming up at the end of the month, 
you will really enjoy men's retreat. So uh, please make plans to attend that. And then August 23rd through the 25th, we have our Washington State Convention in Kennewick Red Lion. And um, we would love to see you there at State Convention. We have a great time at State Convention. It's just power packed with the presence of God, with worship, with instruction, and all kinds of great things. So um, we're thrilled about that. And also this year, our International Children's Ministry Coordinator, Sister Kathy Creasy, is going to be with us. Remember, a couple months ago, she was here at the local church and um, presented her intensive, one of the intensives there for children's ministry, and just did a great job. So this is uh, going to be a real blessing for us to have her. So I encourage all of you to make your reservations at the Red Lion. They give a special rate there, so when you're calling in, um, be sure to say that you're with the Church of God of Prophecy and get that special rate for them. So, today is an exciting day. Uh, you guys are launching forth into some leadership and discipleship ministries here. So, if we can bring those things up here, Brother John. We're going to be talking this morning about some of the components of leadership development. Nope, not that one. <laughs> And these components that we're going to be looking at this morning are in relation to study, going, teaching others, and making disciples. Studying, going, teaching others, making disciples. Let's take a look at this first one here, which is study. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy there, 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now let's take a look at what this word study actually means in the Greek there. Study means to make an effort, to be diligent, to be earnest, to labor. You know, there's just no way around it. Study means work. <laughs> Study means work. How many of, of our young people, or how many here are, are in school? Yeah, several hands. I suspect you have to study, right? <laughs> And there's no way around it, study signifies work. And we are to study to such a degree that we are referred to in the scripture as workmen. A workman, which literally means a laborer. Now, years ago, and this, this really predates me, but, um, well, how many of you know who Bob Denver is? You know, with, you, you probably remember Gilligan's Island. Okay, now we'll go back years before that. How many remember Dobie Gillis? <laughs> Just a few, okay. <laughs> well, this was a scene on a college campus there. And... Uh, Bob Denver played a character by the name of Maynard G. Krebs. And Maynard, if you watch the show long enough, found out that he was a real slacker. He uh, did not do much of anything. In fact, whenever the word work came up in any of the episodes, he would say, work, <laughs> like that, work. And uh, in other words, he tried to do everything he could to get out of work. But study definitely involves work. And um, one of our friends years ago told us about a, a, a young man that um, went to school so long. I mean, you know, study suggests preparation, and, and, and it means that each year that you are learning something new, 
right? I mean, you should be learning something new in second grade, in third grade, and fourth grade, and fifth grade, and all this. Well, uh, in the upper uh, Skagit Valley there, uh, there's a, a little town by the name of Concrete. And uh, up in Concrete, uh, in the school system there, this boy uh, just had a hard time with school, and so he kept repeating school uh, grade after grade, and he repeated a third grade a few times and fifth grade several times. <laughs> and when he was in fifth grade, he was 16 years old, and he was driving to school <laughs> in fifth grade. You know, they didn't even have a place. The teachers were the only ones that had the places to park, but, you know, he was the one there that, that was parking. But the sad thing of it is, is this young boy just kept repeating, grade, you know, fifth grade year after year. And wouldn't that be sad if for us, 10 years from now, we never advanced in the Lord? In other words, we kept repeating the same grade in the Lord year after year after year. In other words, you remained as a baby Christian your first year, your fifth year, your tenth year, fifteenth year. Now, wouldn't you think it odd, and I know all the kids are out here, but if you know one of your kids was uh, in um, first or second grade and they came up and said, you know, start repeating the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and on and on, right? But what if they did that in 10th grade? That would be rather sad, wouldn't it? That would be a sad thing for them to have to repeat. You know, in other words, they're not growing. There's no uh, indication of growth there. So we're going to look at why we should study. According to what it said in 2 Timothy there, chapter 2, either your study or lack thereof will make you approved unto God or ashamed unto God. It's, and there's no in-between. You're either going to be approved unto God or you're going to be ashamed unto the Lord. I don't know how they do it now with report cards. I know when I went to school, they trusted you to bring them home <laughs> to show your mom and dad your report card. So what do they do? Email them now or they mail them. Oh, they mail them to, to make sure they get in the right hands, of course, right? Well, I always kind of you know, I'm thanking God, always did pretty good in school, so I, I really never was ashamed of my report cards, but I had a brother who we talked about earlier who did not like to study, and it reflected on his report cards that way. So when he would get a report card and, and bring it home, for some reason he could never find it or something happened to it or he lost it because, you know what, he didn't want to show his D's and F's to mom and dad. Spiritually speaking, how many of us have D's and F's before our Heavenly Father? Bishop, it's kind of quiet in here. I, I don't know what's going on. So how is your spiritual report card before God? Don't you want to be approved unto God for no other reason? That's why we should study. Because the Bible says, and it's not an option, it's a command. Yeah. Study to show thyself approved unto God. To rightly divide the truth. Why should we study to rightly divide the word of truth? And when you look that up, it literally means cutting straight and distributing it. And there's different thoughts. Bible scholars have different thoughts what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. Some mean, think that it means a cutting of bread and distributing bread that way. Uh, I, I kind of like the, 
explanation where it literally means cutting straight, distributing it. And what that meant is that the priest under the sacrifices of the law, and, and this is so amazing, when, when they uh, cut up the sacrifices, they rightly divided it. And I kind of knew that before, but as I was studying deeper into this, these guys were uh, super butchers. How many has ever done butchering or, you know, like on pigs, cows, whatever, that sorts of thing. And these priests studied how to divide, to cut up the sacrifice. And they, they did it so scrupulously that one half of the spinal bone marrow was found on each side of the backbone. In other words, they did it straight down the line, as straight as you can get. They probably did a whole lot better job than the Safeway butchers and those guys do today. So what he's saying here is that's why we study, so we can rightly divide the word of truth. So that we can be prepared enough so that we know, uh, Bishop, what to give to babes. So we can know what to give to those that are more mature in the Lord. And when we rightly divide the word, Brother Jonathan, so we tell them from Genesis to Revelation what the Bible says about such and such. When you don't rightly divide the word, you get into all kinds of trouble. In fact, that's why there's many denominations today. Because... They don't rightly divide and see what the scripture says concerning any kind of topic. In fact, you remember the guy years ago that made a religion, the Bible says there is no God. It says that. There is no God. But in the fuller context, it says the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. So some of you are saying, what? It says no God. What? What? <laughs> You've got to read the whole verse, and you've got to read everything in context above it and below it according to the chapter, and you have to read hermeneutically everything concerning that topic. You know, if you're doing a topical study, what it is that you're studying about. You take tithing, for instance, and some people say it's just in the Old Testament. No, Jesus brought it into the New Testament. And there's many scriptures. You have to study it out and rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. So that's why we study. To be prepared, to be approved unto God, to rightly divide the word. The next thing that we are to do here is to go. Let's read the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Whoops, did you see the go? Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Go. Study is great, but if we never went, what good would it accomplish? You know, you can study, 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 study. And by the way, let me just say this. I know there's some aspiring scholars out there and, and, and guys that are getting into the Word and all this, and the adversary would have you say, keep learning, keep learning, and that's true, keep learning, but, but I can't ever distribute it until I, I, you know, I'm an Einstein, until I know the whole Bible, right? But that's a tool of the enemy. Whatever you learn, if you're saved and Jesus Christ is in your heart, you can share that with others. You can share that with others, and you're supposed to share that with others. But learn, and the more you learn, give that to others and distribute to others as well. So Jesus commissioned us to go, not to sit. <laughs> 
Isn't that interesting? He does not say here, sit therefore and teach all nations. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. And where are we to go? Well, we learned in Acts chapter 1, and you know, when he says, uh, you know, at, when the promise of the, the comforter and Jesus is talking about that, he says that when the, when the Holy Ghost has come and all that, we are to go to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. And here, folks, I'm not literally saying that you have to go to Africa or go across uh, you know, the continent or this or that, although sometimes that's a good thing to do. But what he's really saying here is when we go to Jerusalem, we're going to those around us that we're comfortable with. Our friends, our family. Are you comfortable with your family? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> friends, family, Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, ooh, those heathenish Samaritans. People I'm not comfortable with. People who don't look and dress like Pastor Smith. That are not cool like Bishop Smith. <laughs> How can I go to them? and to the uttermost parts of the world, Brother Rainier. In other words, what Jesus is telling us is get out of your comfort zone. Go to the ones that you feel least compelled to go to. Boy, it's real easy for me to come up and witness to a guy like Brother Smith here. You know, doesn't smell, looks good. <laughs> <laughs> but how about someone on the other side of the tracks? How about someone that you just don't feel comfortable being around? Aren't you glad that God is no respecter of persons and he doesn't come up, Sister Smith, and say, ooh, I can't, can't minister to that one. I can only go to... I mean, he turned the Pharisees and the disciples' world upside down when he went to the Samaritans and preached to them and ministered to them. <sighs> What's wrong with the Lord? <sighs> And Peter, the disciples just couldn't get it, right? Just couldn't get it. So persecution brought about the, some pronounce it diaspora, some diaspora, but what it literally means is a scattering. A scattering. The Greek meaning through, over, and spiro, dispersal. How many of you watched the Bible series when it was out during Easter and all that? Wasn't that wonderful? But you, did you see when Stephen was martyred there, when they killed him, what happened to the disciples? Did they stay in Jerusalem? We're getting out of town. <laughs> We're getting out of town. And that was the diaspora. The scattering. Because Jesus told them, he said, you know, he said to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. But they could not, uh, Brother Kabbalists understand that. No, we're staying in Jerusalem. So when heavy persecution came, that scattered them out and caused the diaspora. Of course, there was earlier ones, you know, when they were scattered to Babylon and all that kind of thing earlier, like 570 B.C. and so on, right? Okay, but now we're talking about from this side of Christ. They had to be scattered out to get the message out. Have you ever thought about sometimes the difficulties you are going through is because God wants to take you out of your comfort zone? Well, this uh, downy eagle's nest I'm sitting in feels pretty good until the mother starts pulling all the feathers out 
and then it gets really prickly. Ooh, that, that doesn't feel so good, right? And that's what he's doing to us. He allows things to happen in our lives to make us uncomfortable to go out and reach others. Do you know what's sad, but only, I think the statistic is, is like only one out of a hundred people win someone to the Lord? Yeah. That's sad. When Jesus commissioned all of us to go, to go, not to sit, but to go. All right. Teaching others. So let's look at the Great Commission again. Go ye therefore, teach. Do you see the emphasis on teach all nations? Teaching them. Emphasis Jesus places on teaching and preaching. Some of you say, well, you're not a preacher. That's okay, you can teach. Or if you do both of them, you can treach. Right? <laughs> you can do both of them. And here's another thing, Bible teaching or, you know, our teaching in the Word is not only the church's obligation. Okay, what is it? It's a command given by the Lord to parents as well. My, huh. What does it say in Deuteronomy 6 and 7, 6, verses 6 and 7? This is Moses rehearsing what the Lord had given him. He says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Of course, this is where he says, Loving the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and all that. And then verse 7, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And that word diligently, thou shalt teach them diligently, is an exciting word because it means to inculcate, to pierce, to implant in the heart. In other words, we are to teach our young people and parents, you are to teach your children to such a degree the words of the Lord that it pierces their heart and actually becomes implanted inside of them. How many of you, well, you don't have to raise your hand, you know, it may be sensitive, but how many of you have ever had a tooth implant before? Well, what they do when they do that uh, tooth implant is when they put that in, it's literally the bone that they put in is to fuse with your bone in your teeth. In other words, it becomes implanted in there. You better hope it does. <laughs> right. And that's what's supposed to happen with the Word of God, that when we teach, and by the way, parents, and, and some of you say, oh, it's just the parents. No, when Moses is talking, he says, you're to teach to your sons and your sons' sons. In other words, your grandchildren, and I know Brother and Sister Smith do that. Grandparents, you would not want to be off the hook, but your job also is to inculcate, to pierce, to implant inside your your grandkids the Word of God. Whew. Isn't that exciting? And implant to such a degree, Brother Kabbalah, that it, it's part of you. Just like your teeth are part of you. Right? Your teeth are part of you, right? Okay. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I should go there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wow. And notice when, where, how we are to teach our children. Wow, this is good, isn't it? When we sit in the house, when we walk by the way, when we lie down, when we rise up. Wow. 
I'm just going to borrow Brother Chris here for a minute. What's your baby's name? Isaac. 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 How old's Isaac now? Three months. Three months. Beautiful baby, right? Amen. Yeah, you've all seen little Isaac. And, and Isaac's probably way, way, way too young to start teaching the principles of the Lord, right? No. No, I'm glad you answered right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the, the lady that came up to Billy Graham, you know, and she, she had a, a five-year-old. She says, uh, Reverend Graham, when should I start teaching him? Well, how old is he, five? And he says, well, you're five years too late. <laughs> so three months old. Now, according to what Moses told the children of Israel, you are to teach little Isaac when you... Lie down. Yep. When he's lying down, he's supposed to be teaching him. When he rises up, he's supposed to be teaching him. When he's sitting down, he's supposed to be teaching him. And when he's going by the way, he's supposed to be teaching him. So do you notice all that? Every action, everything you're doing, whether you're sitting, rising, lying down, going by the way, walking, you're supposed to be teaching your children. I guess the only exception would be as if you're, you know, skydiving or something like that. Thank you, Brother Chris. Wow, what an obligation is given to us. Jesus said, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Paul said that he did not shun to declare the whole counsel of God. You know, it's up to us, folks, to declare the whole message of God. It's good, Brother Jonathan, to tell people about being saved. But we need to also instruct them in holiness and sanctification. Spiritual formation. We need to teach them how to be disciples of others. We need to teach them about water baptism, which Brother Smith is doing. We need to teach them Growing in the Lord more and more. Being baptized in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Letting the fruit of the Spirit be displayed in you. We have to have the whole message. Because people want the whole message. Do you remember David? He had a rebellious son. And thank God I don't have any rebellious sons. <laughs> In fact, our oldest son, Mr. Chris, here, um, when he was about four years old, came down into my office, into my study, and there received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Whew. That was one of the highlights of my life, right there when that happened. Wow. So David had a rebellious son by the name of Absalom. Absalom was gaining support to, to go and fight against his father, David. And so they went to war, and uh, of course, David sent his commanders, Joab, and different ones out, and he told Joab, he said, spare the young man at all costs. Try to spare the young man. <laughs> well, this is one time Joab did not really listen to David. Uh, but we find out that, um, you know, when, when different people were being killed and the battle was in array and on and on it was going, that Absalom had really long hair, really long hair. And as he was... Uh, on his donkey and was going under an oak tree, his hair got caught up in the boughs of the tree and suspended him there by his hair. And it was told Joab, guess what? <laughs> yeah, Absalom's hanging in a tree. And so Joab got 
three little arrows and threw them through his heart. Killed him. Now, that's not the story. I mean, you know, the, what I'm trying to get across here. But, it, you know, so they, they ended the battle. Now, in those days for communications, they did not have cell phones. You all have your cell phones. You're probably reading them while I'm preaching and everything else here. <laughs> no, I know you're not. Uh, but, but, you know, our communication age is just amazing. I mean, you know, you can all over the world, you can find out what's going on and this and that. Well, they did not have cell phones. They did not have mail at that time. You know, they did. So what did they have? Runners. Runners. So it was a cool thing to be a runner in David's army. It was. I mean, that was a pretty cool position to be a runner because the runners are the ones that gave the messages, you know. To, and so um, Joab tells um, Cushai, one of the runners, he says, go tell David what has transpired. Tell him everything that's happened. So Cushai runs out, and Ahimaaz, another runner, comes up and says, I want to tell David too. I want to tell him too. Can I run? Can I run? Can I run? Cushai's already gone. You can go another time. Oh, please, 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 let me run. Okay, Ahimaaz, go run. <laughs> so here they are. Cushai's got quite a head start on him, but Ahimaaz is such a runner that he overtakes David. He runs right by him, like flash, you know, and comes to David, and David, so someone on the tower says, boy, me thinkest, I like the way the Bible puts these things, me thinkest it's Ahimaaz the way he's running, you know, it looks like Ahimaaz. So anyway, uh, he gets there, and so David wants to find out what? What the message is. He wants to find out about his son. So Ahimaaz gets there and he says, Good tidings unto you, king, that your enemies have been overtaken. David says, How is my son, the young man Absalom? Well, all I can tell you, David, is that there was a great tumult there and I left and I don't know. <laughs> Stand over there, he says. So, Ahimaaz stands over there, and then by that time, I, um, Cushai runs in, and David just has to know what happened to my son. And David says it in such a way, he says, thy son, O King David, is as all the men that have died in the field. And of course, after that, we find that David grieves and all this. I said all that to say this, that's why we need to study, because there's people out there that want the whole message. Amen. They want the whole message. They want to find out, you know, everything that the Lord is speaking to their heart. So when someone comes up, and that's why Paul says to be able to give an answer to every man or the reason of the hope that's within you with meekness and with fear, Right? to be able to give that answer to them. So that's why, uh, you know, uh, when, he, when he says, he, he commands us to teach all things. You don't cherry pick whatever things you are to teach. We are to teach all things. Okay, let's move ahead here. Making disciples. When we study, we go, we teach, we preach, we are making disciples. Disciples that look just like us, that model after us. Look at what Paul told Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. And it's so great to see all the young people out here, and I want to say this to you young people, let no man despise your youth. In other words, do not let anyone put you down for your youth. You are valuable to the Lord in, in more ways than you know. So be an example. How, as a young person, are we to be an example? In word. 
So we must know the word in conversation. That's not only how we're talking, but in our behavior, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Here, example suggests being a model of imitation, a pattern for others to follow. And this is what I want to say about Bishop Smith here. What, what you want to happen is that you yourself would be cloned. I wish I could clone Bishop Smith and send him all over the region. Wouldn't that be something, Sister Shirley? <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying in that is we need workers all over the place that have a passion, that have a hunger, that have a desire to minister the word of truth. But remember, when you are cloned, it's not you that is cloned, but it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the thing that's being cloned. And let me state emphatically, cloning is divine, not human. Cloning is divine, not human. In fact, when a man attempts to clone things, there's a mess. How many remember in 1996, when Dolly the Sheep was cloned. Remember that? Well, I mean, that was a big ado among scientists, you know, why we've, we've cloned another sheep here, you know. And so um, let's, let's take a picture, uh, a look at that, Sister Knoblitz. There's Dolly up there, the, the top and the bottom picture. I'll say something about the bottom picture in a minute, but there's, there's Dolly, and, and Dolly has three mothers. Now, you think things are confusing today the way things are, but Dolly had three mothers uh, because, first of all, there was the mother that provided the ovum or the egg, and then there was another mother from a mammary gland that provided the DNA. They extracted the D DNA from a mammary gland and put it into this ovum, a denucleated cell. And then uh, when it uh, developed through electric shock and all that and made what they call a blastocyte, which is several cells together, then they implanted that inside of another sheep. So we have three mothers for poor little Dolly here. Scientists hail this as a great achievement, but what the scientists failed to tell us is that Dolly came about after 277 failed attempts. Uh-huh. And what else they failed to tell you is Dolly died of arthritis and lung problems when she was only six years old, not even half of what her adult life was supposed to be. And yet you hear about cloning today. In fact, if you could read that little thing on the left side there of Dolly the sheep, it says they're trying to clone uh, pig uh, organs uh, so that they can be used in humans. But they put a stop to that because, well, the cloning just is not working out for some reason like we thought it was going to. Because that is a creation element which belongs to God. With that song we sang this morning, you cannot create God, and not only can you not create, you cannot create nothing. <laughs> you can't create anything. He is the total creator. So when you mess around and try to do human cloning or any other kind of cloning, this is what happens in the bottom picture there. There's Dolly again, but that's a taxidermy Dolly. So how many of you want to be taxidermied, stuffed, <laughs> you know? <laughs> wow. So folks, only God can bring life. Only God can take two gametes, 
bring them together and miraculously give life. Only God can give physical life. Only God can give spiritual life. Only the Spirit can bring regeneration. Only He can bring about new life in Jesus Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Only God gives physical life, young people, and only God gives spiritual life. Hallelujah. So what is our job? We want to become and we want to teach others so that they can become isomers of Jesus. There's different kinds of isomers, uh, but this is an optical isomer, and you see the mirror plane there. Those are mirror images of each other, of, of that uh, molecule there, of the carbon, the hydrogen, and the oxygen, but they're not the same. Do you, do you see that? Because if you took one and overlaid it on top of the other, it would not be the same. In other words, if, you, if there was a mirror right here, and you're looking at the mirror, and that person you know, is you that you're looking at could come out, well, your left arm would be that person's right arm. Right? So... We are to become as close as we can to Jesus, but we can't be exactly Jesus. In fact, that's why it tells us in 2 Corinthians that when Moses came down from the mount and, and you know, he had the glory of God all about him and on and on. And, and Paul goes on and says, and we, when we behold in a glass... In other words, when we're looking in a mirror, he says what we should see is the glory of God and we should be changed into the same image from glory to glory. In other words, from one degree of glory to another. Whew. So when we look at people, we're supposed to be seeing Jesus Christ in them. And that's who we imitate. So turn to someone and tell the truth and say, I see Jesus in you. <laughs> <laughs> I see Jesus in you. Praise God. When, when will Jesus come? Do you know when Jesus comes? You're not quite sure? Huh? Not even the sun will know? Okay. Okay. Well, I, I know when he's going to come. I know when he's going to come. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Bishop Smith says. John tells us when. Beloved, now you are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what ye shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, ye shall be like him, for ye shall see him as he is. Let me tell you, when I know when Jesus comes, when you look like him, when we as the body of Christ look like him and reflect ourselves as a mirror to him, that's when Jesus Christ is coming, when the Father looks down and says, Son, they look like you. They look like you. Sound the trumpet, Gabriel. Go down and get them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what is our job? Study, go, teach, make disciples, and be like Paul and says, follow me as I follow Christ. God bless you all.